Sarah. Um, now we're moving on to the uh, panel discussion. So if we could get, actually, don't run away yet. Um, come back to the stage, the uh, Karen and Karen and chat, and we will have the panel discussion, see if there's any questions on Twitter as well. And then we get to go for lunch. So again, um, the idea of the panel is to address the, the topic more generally in terms of um, accessibility as broad topics. So if there's any questions, I can repeat them. There we go. So I'll repeat that. So the question was, um, in general, course design, we, we have this impression that pop-ups aren't good, but what we're hearing is that for a user that needs to have it more visually accessible, it, it is a good thing. So um, does that cause us to re-examine whether pop-ups are good or not? Is that the is a good summary of the question? Um. I've kind of found the, the opposite of you guys, that having pop-ups has created issues, maybe not for my visually impaired users, but for my new computer users. All of our multimedia used to come in a pop-up window, and then how do I get to the next one? We did customize our Moodle so that the little course navigator thing when you're in resources also repeats at the bottom. So when you get the bottom of the page, there's a next button. It's not like way up in the top right corner kind of hiding in Moodle. Um, I, I do think that it depends on your user and who they are. Now, I, I'm not... You guys feel free to correct me if you feel I'm wrong. Um, but as you're teaching people JAWS the first time, they're not proficient, right? So using those web controls to navigate, you know, to collect buttons or go through forms, um, there's definitely a learning curve in how to do that. So if someone's new, I can understand why. Pop it up, you know, especially because it's an introduction to a computer course, not a, you know, astrophysicist course, right? So to try to make it, you know, here's your information right there and then they can close it. It's probably good navigation skills to start as opposed to browsing through web pages. I've tried to get away from pop-ups myself, however. I'm just going to take it two seconds and then pass it to Karon. One of the things that we realize is that when you open a pop-up, the reader goes through much less work than when you're still in Moodle. Because every time you open a page, it goes again through the HTTP, you are logging, ask Karon, da 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 When you open a pop-up, the only thing that gets read is the HTTP. So it might be, in terms of navigation, a little bit harder, but it sells a lot, saves a lot of time, and students get used to having that user interface design in that course, and they can only close one window and continue their course. So we found that to be useful. Just the readability, it's much faster. So the content in your pop-up is not in Moodle? In, not in Moodle. So all those, all those headings and linked lists and stuff. It's outside. Okay. Yeah. And in addition, um, the pop-ups actually don't have the nav navigational um, buttons on a browser, so it's basically the content and the URL. Um, and like it was mentioned before, um, you know, if a user, they can just close the window easier, like with shortcut buttons, or you know, like I said, you know, if they accidentally click the back button too many times, they're going to lose their whole entire Moodle. Um, so for our instance, we just um, found this um, the best solution um, to a for our course. Two questions. I'll start with the back. So the question is, is, is there some sort of style sheet that can be applied that eliminates the, the noise, I guess, such as reading all the yeah. login all the time? <clears throat> I'm not the programmer, though. I, I try to ad-lib where I can. Um, so correct me if I misspeak here. But the way, 
It's the way that JAWS interacts with websites. So if there's a hyperlink, it's going to come there. And if there's a heading, it's going to get shown. So you can certainly kind of minimize content. You can do some things with style sheets to try to simplify it. But at the end of the day, JAWS is going to scrape the whole page. So if it's on the page, it's gone. So you could try to minimize stuff. Um, where currently what I showed was on Moodle 1.9. My Moodle 2 development server we just ordered yesterday. Um, and I think there's some accessibility pros and cons. I sent out a link over Twitter to the, an accessibility report of 2.1, which I haven't read yet to just be full disclosure. So I think there are some things that can be done. Kind of the future with uh, HTML5, um, there's some accessibility stuff that's getting thrown out. But there's, uh, I think it's Web Aria, which basically allows you as a developer to put landmarks in that then feeds that information back to the screen reader user. How that works, how that's done, again, that, that's my uh, invisible programmer friend's area of expertise. Um, but take a look for Web Aria, Web-A-R-A-I. That's going to be your new evolving standard that we're hoping doesn't fork from HTML5. I think there's some grinding of heads in the um, standard makers sort of area. Um, but that, the hope with that is that then it feeds information much more cleaner back to the user so they're not having to scrape the full page or whatever for information. But the key thing is conveyed to the assistive technology and the user to help them navigate. I think another comment to that is we haven't found a solution to scrape that out. but just does allow you to jump directly to a piece or an, a link in the page. So the most important thing that you can do for accessibility is consistency. Every module, every link, every page has to work exactly the same. So that helps the students as they get familiarized with the page that they can use their controls to jump directly to the information and not read all the HTTP. And that's when you see the final version of the course, that's exactly what Caron was able to do. Make it very simple, but at the same time, same. Always the same. You access every single page exactly the same. You link to every single link in the same way. Everything is ordered in the same way. And that helps your users get familiarized and be able to jump and not have to listen to all the information, but jump to the pieces that they request or need to go to. So there's a question here, and then I understand there's one also from the Twitter feed. Yeah, okay, so... Um, Can I just repeat that first? Sorry? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there, the question was, there's liberated learning dot C, I think it's dot CA actually. Is it? Um, it's transcribeyourclass.ca. Oh. Oh, okay. That's the free pilot project that's going on right now. Okay, so the question was, what happens after March when it's not free anymore? Because uh, there's probably a few of us who are really excited by that, actually. Yeah, no, the Liberated Learning Consortium is like this group of all these. It's kind of start of uh, you ivory tower folks with all your knowledge, um, some work being done with this in different areas. This pilot project was to try to take some of these things that are being used and put in the hand of the nonprofit folks that are actually using them. So the Transcribe Your Class project is trying to help us, help them identify youth with disabilities in different post-secondaries around Canada and give them a similar access system. Um, I wouldn't say it's been without a difficulty along the way. A lot of times some of the teacher folks don't like having their content recorded and where is it going to get shared and this is my intellectual property. Um, which, you know, bugs me, right? I'm trying to give you a solution, you know, stop throwing up roadblocks that I don't... Anyways, another conversation. Um, but the Liberated Learning Consortium has been running for over 15 years. Um, IBM is, was the big kind of corporate one in the background, providing the speech um, uh, language models and recognition. Um, and they've recently partnered with Nuance, which is Dragon Naturally Speaking. Some of you may have seen that, where you talk at types. So you kind of have your, you know, your world leaders in speech recognition providing the technology in the background. Um, the consortium is continuing. They're lo always looking for new university partners. But to be a partner, you have to contribute lecture data to help build better voice models, which is what they're working on right now. Um, well, we're going back to the government for more money, as nonprofits are good at that. Um, we'll see what comes of it. My personal opinion is, as they propose to reach 225 students and aren't near that number right now, that doesn't look good when you go asking for more money and you didn't hit your targets. But, you know, this is where you can help, right? If you have someone in your class, 
Um, doesn't have to be a hearing impairment either, right? I think being able to kind of search your classes by keyword and you can jump to lecture 14 to the 35 minute mark where he's talking about Macbeth. Um, I think that's just information accessibility in general, not just for a select usability group. And that goes back to that universal design where you can design something for one user group, but it helps a broad range of users. I would just add to that for second language users, that would also be hugely beneficial. Uh, we have to capture the Twitter question. So what kind of feedback have you had from your course, like from the users, and um, do they like the pop-ups? Uh, we actually haven't had um, any feedback yet as um, very limited um, students are using it, and plus um, the course is in session at this point. Yeah. So hopefully maybe um, in the new year we may have some feedback from the department. Um. I guess a good part of being a nonprofit, I think sometimes we have it a little harder. We have to do these user feedback surveys all the time to the point where clients ask, didn't I just tell you how much I liked it two weeks ago? Um, so uh, we do do through that. We do kind of like in our career program, we do kind of a halfway through the program feedback survey and an end where they kind of say about each part what they like, what they don't like, and what they'd like to see change. So that kind of keeps a feedback loop. And in our Moodle course at the end of each section, so at the end of career research, there is again another feedback survey. What did you like? What, so you can kind of give a kind of like, you know, feedback or my experience for six weeks and at the end of the bit of uh, each little section along the way. For a lot of my users, again, they're kind of new to computers, so the fact that they're coming into a classroom and they're talking to people in different areas and they're doing their work online, it's quite novel for them, I think. Again, a lot of them come in without an email account, or if they do, they don't know how to do attachments. So to be kind of learning online and using computers with it, I think there's kind of a novelty and it's kind of like, wow, you know, look, I, I figured out these computer things and going along. So I think we get kind of a lot of glean for kind of being the, teaching them kind of practical skills that they can use. The only thing we can say is that um, through the project, Caron was working with the department head who was totally visually impaired and one of the faculty members. And there was a lot of feedback going back and forth. And they liked it much better than the other course they had. Um, the other comment that I want to make is that originally when Karan was working on this project, she was thinking only about people that were blind. And a couple of instructors in the program said, but the, we have a lot of people with low vision. So as you can see in the final version, actually the look and feel has to be nice too. It's not just, just working smoothly through the links. It really has to look nice for those that have low vision but can increase the resolution to see the course. The final thing that I would like to say, not about the feedback, is that um, there's a couple of apps in, uh, for the iPad and the Android, and I think there's for BlackBerry, mTouch, that makes any course that has been done in Moodle totally accessible, totally accessible. And I would invite anybody to just download it. It does have a cost, the mTouch and the mTouch Plus. I think it's $4. But if you have a nice course, resources, assignments, everything comes very streamlined and your Moodle course comes automatically accessible. Unfortunately, our visually impaired students, not all of them have devices that they can log into Moodle. So we still are working on making the desktop version very accessible. Just, just a plus one to that. Quite often, a lot of my users will use the mobile site from their desktop. Because the mobile site is usually just the meat and potatoes. It's not all the extra crap on the side and banner ads and extra stuff. It's content. So, um, and one of my instructors is also visually impaired. And that's how she uses Facebook. She goes to m.facebook.com and it's profile and wall post. And that's it. There's no little sideline things. There's no keyboard traps. All the noise is cut out. So um, a lot of kind of things that you can do for accessibility to make it better is actually also your mobile stuff clean, simple, fast interfaces, cut out all the garbage around it. That was very nice of you to tie the two, present, the two categories together so wonderfully. <laughs> um, I have a, a question, unless there's somebody else who's got one first. I don't mind waiting. Okay, so what struck me with that is that even with the enhancements, just how difficult of an experience it still is. And I'm wondering whether um, you can speak a little bit about what still needs to be done in terms of accessibility, because clearly even with JAWS, it's, it's really not at all the same experience as it is for somebody who can quickly scan a page. And 
um, that has big implications, I think, for learners. Um, well, I think programs actually like the, I'll give you guys a rub here, uh, the VCC one where it kind of trains in the computer skills certainly helps having that kind of digital literacy. The, the government of Canada has what they consider the nine essential skills for people to be employed, reading, writing, math, working with others. Computer literacy is one of them. So programs that kind of reach people with low computer literacy and help build those up are very important. Um, that's not, however, where the funding models are going on the provincial and federal levels. Um, so having that definitely helps. Um, it also seems that a lot of accessibility stuff is if you're using this setup. So again, Internet Explorer 6, plenty of issues. A um, lot of Google's accessibility improvements, the, the big asterisks on everything. This will work on Chromebooks with Chromebox. I don't know anyone that has a Chromebook and a Chromebox, so that's great. It's accessible in that, but how accessible is it really? Um, Firefox seems to be the web browser of choice for um, screen reader users. However, uh, users that can't use their hands uh, due to disability issues usually, uh, paralysis, um, it's Internet Explorer all the way. Firefox will not take speech input quite often. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a moving target, right? There's all these little, little pieces. This works under this situation, and this works under this situation. That's where I'm hoping HTML5 is kind of, you know, one beast to rule them all. I, I may be looking at that with uh, rose-colored glasses, but that, that seems to be kind of when the, when the platform is the web. I think that's where uh, things can be done along the way. I also think, um, like Chad said, you know, with the computer skills, um, when I met with the department, um, department head um, for this project, they were very well versed in computer skills and with JAWS, and it was almost seamless um, for them. Um, but to get to that point, um, I think there still needs um, a lot of work um, to be to be done. Um, you know, one, one computer skills, one is you know getting a platform that you know, that works, you know, across all browsers. Um, JAWS is a, is a PC-based software. Um, what do the user use as Mac? Um, you know, I guess the iPad has it built in. Um, the Macintosh has some things um, built in for accessibility, but it's not, doesn't have the, um, I guess, capability like JAWS does at this point. One, one of the really actually uh, amazing things is the, the iPhone. It has uh, a screen reader built into it as part of it. It's not a separate app you have to buy. It's not some sort of thing that's been hacked in later, which accessibility so often is an afterthought with trying to be ground in. So a lot of apps work quite well on your iPhone. And that's a built-in screen reader into it, right? So the JAWS software can cost, I think, between 500 and, let me pull the chat. It's usually me making the noise. Um, yeah, so the draw screen reader alone for your PC can cost, I think, between $400 and $600. So, I mean, that's almost the cost of your phone right there, right? And it comes with it. So as, as things come more mobile and smaller, they're going to be built in. The Android device does not have a screen reader at all. The Windows 7 phone does not have a screen reader at all. So, again, different people have taken different sort of initiatives. Apparently, uh, the next Android 4.0 has a screen reader in it. Ice cream sandwich, I think it's called. I don't know. Um, Web 2.0, you don't make up the words. You just go look silly. Just repeat them, right? Um, so, yeah. So, I think this is slowly coming a little bit more to the forefront. Perhaps our aging population and some of their needs will make this more of a demand. Um, if you're more interested in kind of getting geared um, in it, there's a, a Twitter hashtag, A11Y, which is short for accessibility. Um, that's accessibility's long to spell. So, um, so there's all your nerds tweeting about kind of best practices and accessibility things that can be done along the way. And there's a lot of those alley conferences going on of developers kind of sharing accessibility stuff. There's one in Seattle in May. There's one in Ottawa this Friday um, in terms of uh, people just sharing accessibility programming best practices. So um, Twitter is great for seeing things from other areas for sure. I think we're done for it's right on time for lunch so thank you all of you okay, thanks everyone so we'll um, now have lunch in the atrium and uh, we'll be meeting at 12 30 for our student panel so you won't want to miss that okay thanks
We were down for 80 because I